You're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network's exclusive coverage of the Cardinal Health Retail Business Conference 2017, conference and exhibition in San Antonio, Texas. RBC is more than a pharmacy business conference. This interactive gathering of pharmacy owners started in 1990 as a regional show and has since grown into the industry's largest trade show for independent pharmacies. While the conference location changes from year to year, the mission of the RBC remains the same, to help independent pharmacies navigate the ever-changing marketplace by giving them access to the best pharmacy business vendors in the industry. And now, here are your hosts of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, Dr. Aaron Albert and Todd Yuri. Hello, this is Brad Tice, Director of Product Strategy and Commercialization at Cardinal Health, and you are listening to the Pharmacy Podcast. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. This is Todd Yuri, the host and founder of the show. This is day three of the Cardinal Health RBC 2017. Good morning, Aaron Albert. How are you? Good morning. Morning is always good, right? Especially on a Friday. It is. (laughs) It's a super duper Friday here. And what a wonderful evening we had last night here at San Antonio. I have to say the facilities, the setup, the river walk, it's absolutely gorgeous. And the weather last evening was very cooperative too. Yes, very much so. So we have a special guest from Cardinal Health here with us today. For those at the conference on the showroom floor, you'll see us here in the booth, um, embedded in the Cardinal Health uh, atmosphere, which is just an honor to be here. Mr. Brad Tice, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. Thank thank you, Todd. It's uh, great to be here. I'm excited to reach out to so many different people across the country. So today's subject, just so everyone knows, I'm sure by the title of the show, you probably have already guessed it, provider status. And it's a frustrating but exciting subject to talk about. What I want to do is get the perspective from one of the greatest and largest wholesalers in the world. Brad, tell us the updates and the initiatives around provider status. Give us an update. What's happening? Well, there, you know, I'm glad we're focusing on this area because, you know, we've been after provider status for several years now, and we want to make sure that uh, we don't lose the momentum in going after that designation. Uh, I was fortunate to be on the board of trustees of the American Pharmacists Association when we decided to really, as a profession, go after provider status for pharmacists and make that a priority. And we knew at the time that it it wasn't going to happen overnight. And so we're several years into this, but we have made so much progress in uh, really rallying the profession and unifying the profession around everyone focused on getting provider status passed to get um, pharmacists the ability to bill from medical services, to bill on the medical side. When we use medications, we save money on the medical side. And that's really where our services are benefiting and where pharmacists need to get paid. So... We have seen tremendous uptake on the uh, on the hill, for example. And, you know, it doesn't feel like it all the time, but lobbyists and others in Washington D.C. are astounded that we have so much support for uh, the legislation. And now we're seeing a lot happen at the state level. And so California, Washington, have and others have passed. Uh, provider status legislation at the state level. We're seeing that implemented. I was just uh, in at our actually a Tennessee Pharmacy Association annual meeting where uh, the executive director from Washington State was was talking and giving some of the examples of their success and and showing how in 2016. So while many people across the country don't realize this. Ed Pharmacy is billing over $400,000 in medical care provided by pharmacists and get re- getting reimbursed over $200,000 for providing that care. That's the first step, and they're really learning the, the, the steps that need to be taken from credentialing, establishing the network, or the, the infrastructure for uh, provider status once it becomes national. So we're seeing great strides. Even though you don't see and hear about it every day, it doesn't always feel like it. So many pharmacists who are working and understanding the value of medication therapy management and in fact billing and getting paid for it have also started to work with physicians for incident to billing. 
and it's another way to pass through some of their services and actually get paid for it. But it's very difficult, and it's very um, condensed, and it has lots of details, and you have to do lots of paperwork. And right. so, how do you think provider status will alleviate that? Um, I don't know what the word is, confusion, really, to make some of the services that pharmacists are already doing payable specifically. And, and give us some examples. Sure. So, you know, incident two billing has really opened up over the last few years where they've changed some of the, the requirements. And whereas before, the, uh, the care had to be delivered in the physician office right. and and it's very limited and they've expanded that and so it has created more opportunities for pharmacists. Uh, it has not necessarily grown as much as, for instance, the chronic care management program because the reimbursements haven't been as high and, and the opportunity for the physician's office hasn't been as, uh, as great. But what we're seeing with um, the provider status examples, for example, in Washington State is that Pharmacists are billing for and able to provide services for things like travel vaccinations, for diabetes self-management care, uh, for in-home visits and helping patients to use their medications right in the home when they're struggling with that. And so uh, that's just the start. There are other examples. And it's really going to get pharmacists fitting within the overall traditional healthcare model that they're providing services in uh, rather than being excluded and, and having to find ways uh, maybe around that to, to kind of put a square peg in a round hole a little bit. MTM was the start. It, it enabled uh, pharmacists to get paid for delivering services, but it's really been an administrative program and it's focused on the star ratings where the health plan designates who can is eligible eligible to be paid for rather than a pharmacist seeing a problem that a patient is having and being able to really actively address that problem and bill for the services because they see they're solving a problem um, for the patient. Brad, I focus in the pharmacy podcast on career development and I know you have a very interesting background yourself. So let's start with the question or back up to how did you get to where you are today in terms of your own career? And can you share a little bit more about FUSE, the new initiative with Cardinal Health? Sure. Um, yeah, so so I have always been, I've had a kind of mission focus to my career where when I graduated pharmacy school, going back to the, the mid 90s now, my mission was to implement pharmacist care services and get pharmacists paid for delivering those services that would uh, change practice. And so in some ways it's been an uphill battle, it's been a career long effort, uh, but every place that I've gone to has been with that in mind. And so I started out in chain pharmacy and with the thought that if I changed a chain, I could change a thousand stores instead of one at a time. Um, and I, I, in my first couple of years of practice, we were really focused on that was the pharmaceutical care days. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so we were counseling patients and trying to figure out how to work that into workflow. And then uh, went to a diabetes certificate training program back in the 90s, which was, you know, we were all about the different certificate training programs and figuring out our, our niches and uh, came back and worked to implement that in practice. And then I had an opportunity to go to Drake University as, and implement a, be director of a community care laboratory where I got to implement new clinical services from cholesterol testing to immunizations to bone density, whatever we thought we could really make an impact with. And, and so that really grew kind of my entrepreneurial spirit efforts. And, uh, and, and that took me to, uh, away from academia and actually into an MTM startup uh, where we were really focused on you know, growing MTM at, at the time. And then a brief time at, at a managed care company and then, then here at Cardinal as product leader uh, for MTM where we've grown MTM as a service and it's really filled a need of helping pharmacies to deliver care and figure out how to implement MTM and, and impact their, 
their star ratings and their DIR fees. And then uh, this next effort going over into Fuse, which I'm glad you mentioned because uh, it's so exciting. Fuse is our innovation center within Cardinal Health, which is really a unique environment to identify problems and opportunities uh, in healthcare and, and across Cardinal Health. Uh, you know, we have so many different touch points to the industry. And so to be able to identify areas and then have the time to investigate them and put design thinking behind them and then come up with solutions and implement those solutions. And one of those solutions that we're, we're working on bringing to market is a new medication management device uh, we call Empower. And really we see it as a part of the whole system of enabling a pharmacist and really connecting the pharmacist to the patient much more closely. So this device will enable pharmacists to see patient's adherence and be connected to the patients at a dose level so that if the patient's not taking their medications, they can reach out to them, and we're already seeing it happen, and get them back on track, and then it's connected to peripheral devices. So now we're really getting, such as a glucometer, and being able to match up the blood glucose levels with the adherence and look for patterns of patients understand that. And so it, that's just the beginning, but it, it's a really exciting opportunity and to bring these solutions that are going to connect the patient and the pharmacist much more closely and help pharmacists to take that next step in, in connecting to the patient and serving the patient. I think that says a lot for Cardinal to be investing in an innovation lab to really experiment with different types of services that once proven are pushed out to the marketplace that pharmacists can absorb and adopt. I have a complex question. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting here listening to you I listened to what Aaron had to say based on careers and based on what's going to happen to pharmacists' careers based on provider status. So I'm not even sure how to ask this, but I'll try. So <laughs> I'll try to answer. Yes, this. thank you. <laughs> so the world of ICD-10 codes, for example, we know in the thousands and thousands of codes that you load into your electronic health record, you can track a condition, you can track a therapy based on that code. Okay, so. Let's say tomorrow we all wake up and boom, provider status is here. There's only so much money in the pot. That's it. There's only so much money for healthcare services. So how, literally how, will a pharmacist get paid for specific services that they're administering ongoing, especially with comorbidity, multiple disease states, polypharmacy situations, how do they actually get paid for services that they're providing based on the existing system of tracking and data, CMS, reimbursement? Explain that to our listeners, because to me, it's like my eyes start rolling back in my head. So uh, try to try to Rubik's long, cube that. How long do we want to talk? You so, got to do it in two minutes. It's a great Go. question because it really and and so. Having just gotten elected president-elect of the American Pharmacists Association, congratulations! I'm really excited to, to serve and and to address as this as hopefully you know, we expect it. We have high hopes of, a, of the legislation passing in the near term. And I have a daughter who's just starting college and has chosen pre-pharmacy, and so I'm very you know invested in the profession and seeing pharmacist careers uh, advance and, and opportunities advance and. What's so great about that question is that it really marks a fundamental shift in pharmacy practice. And that shift that everyone needs to be aware of and be thinking about and, and we have to design models around is that pharmacies bill at the pharmacy level. Medical care gets billed and reimbursed at the provider level. We're gonna move from a time where pharmacists are booked to a, to a time where pharmacists are going to be more empowered to deliver care and be more empowered as individual practitioners delivering care. And that is going to be a fundamental shift in pharmacy that we're really just maybe on the cusp of that. And so it's really maybe hasn't hit everyone's radar screens yet. All of that other stuff around you know, the ICD-10 codes and the billing, that's exactly what 
Washington State is going through right now. They are really learning the lessons. Their pharmacies are learning the lessons around what does it take to be, what, what does it take and what does it mean to be credentialed? What does it take to get in network of a payer, whether that's Medicare or another health plan? And then to think about doing that across multiple payers. And then how do you set up the medical billing systems? There's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the CPESN and some of the work that's, that's going on here at the conference. And you know, one of the areas that that is addressing is the ability for a pharmacist to not bill, but to communicate their care to other uh, to other providers, to, to other people on the healthcare team. So the e-care plan is being developed, and standards around communicating care is, is really just happening right now. That's really going to enable pharmacists to communicate the care, and then also we have to set up all of those uh, credentialing and billing and and other infrastructure to make it all happen. So at the Pharmacy Podcast Network, it's been Aaron that has developed a very deep, meaningful vertical and show about your career in pharmacy and expanding it beyond the retail setting, long-term care setting, the specialty setting. Some of the shows that she's done and interviews that she's done has really dug into what you can do with your PharmD degree. So this next question, Aaron, how do you see provider status truly impacting the expansion of the pharmacist's role in healthcare? I used to think it was like a, a switch that needed to be flipped. And now I think of it more as a spectrum. And Brad, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but things like California, for example, now allowing uh, pharmacists to prescribe oral contraception, you know, 20 years ago when Washington State started pharmacist vaccinations. It's been a series of small changes that have led to where we are today. And I don't know, Brad, if you agree with that or... Well, I, that's great that I, yes, I agree with that. I'm actually giving a uh, presentation in our showcase theater this afternoon on helping pharmacists to make incremental change. Yeah. Because one of the you know, one of the aspects of this change is what do our patients expect from us and and what are they prepared to expect from us and you know, when i went to that diabetes training program early on in my career and i finished it and i came back i was just like these patients don't look at me any differently across that counter today than they did yesterday they don't know i'm I have all these diabetes services that i want to offer them and so we have to also uh, think about it in terms of you patients think we have a right to play in this space and how do we earn that and usually that happens incrementally and not Overnight. just by flipping the yeah, switch. Absolutely. So in closing, I'm thinking I always like to give our listeners a call to action, something that they can do to help an initiative. One thing that bothers me is pharmacists that complain about their status and about their position and I mean, some of it's jovial, some of it's funny. Um, we have Twitter followers that make it a lot of fun to follow some of their rants. However, in reality, we have to all be doing something to get us to where we're going. So what's your call to action for our listeners? What, what can they do to push and to provide information to the powers that be to make provider status a reality? Well, I can probably think of a lot of things. Uh, you know, since I'm going, going to be incoming president of APHA, I think they should all be members of the American Pharmacist Association. It's really a small fee, and it really helps to speak as a large body to say pharmacists are unified. So I think that's one thing. Two, contact their senators and legislators and, and talk up our House Representative Bill 592 and Senate Bill 109 so that we can get those passed. We have co-sponsors, we have lots of co-sponsors, more than anyone would have ever thought. It's a bipartisan effort, but it's time to push it over the top yep. and get it done. And so yep. the more pressure that we can get there and then really start making those changes in your practices so that they are incremental and so the patients see you as more than just handing pills across the counter and realize it's all of the services, it's any of the services that you can do, whether that's immunizations, whether that's talking to a patient every month about medication synchronization and taking that time to talk to them about their medications, 
every connection point to show that you add care and add value to the patients and the doctors and the care team around you, that's all valuable. So part of my role at, um, as director of strategy for an addiction recovery organization, New Season, which is 72 centers, 30,000 patients, 22 states, I coach some of our center directors how to impact the community through partnerships with physicians and the local press. So my advice for pharmacy owners that are listening to this show, reach out to your local publication, your local paper, get a state representative, a state senator to come to your pharmacy for a mini presentation per se and a tour of your, uh, of your pharmacy and talk to them as a piece of provider status, talk to them about medication therapy management, talk to them about what you're doing to impact community health. Senators and state representatives, state representatives love that stuff and it will feature them. And you know what, you'll get yourself in the paper, you'll get a, you'll get a picture with them and the, now the, the local paper likes that story too. So that's my advice for I, I think that's pharmacy. super, just because most people do not realize everything that pharmacists can do and are doing. And, and to demonstrate that care and to demonstrate all the, the different touch points and the ways that we can impact care and show how we can improve access to care because that's really what this bill is also about is serving those medically underserved areas that's where it's going to start and uh, the more examples and that we can help people understand that the better. Brad Tice, Cardinal Health, thank you so much for being on the Pharmacy Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Cardinal Health, helping independent pharmacies successfully grow their pharmacy businesses for over 45 years while advocating stronger relationships with patients for healthier communities throughout the country. We thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Podcast live coverage of the Cardinal Health RBC 2017. Be sure to join us next year for the RBC 2018 in downtown beautiful San Diego, California, June 27th through June 30th.